Okay, I don't like that one. Something I felt like I didn't know enough about was Miss Cal. Somebody likes this. I'm not that guy. So I thought it'd be a good idea to fix that today on HTD. <laughs> So as I said, I didn't know much about Ms. Kyle, but I want to. And for me, the solution to that situation is to A, do some research and B, do some tasting. So I have done the research part already. Uh, let's start with what I found out because some of you, for some of you, this is gonna be new information. This is why you're watching this episode. You wanna know what is mezcal. Mezcal is a type of agave-based spirit that is produced in Mexico. And what is and is not mezcal is a tightly regulated affair. Uh, see, uh, there's a number of agave-based spirits that are not mezcal or tequila. And yes, tequila is, at least according to my research, a type of mezcal, but it is mezcal that is specifically produced in the state of Jalisco. Uh, I hope I'm saying that right, guys. I don't know if it's Jalisco or Jalisco. Um, Jalisco, I think, sounds more correct to my gringo ears. Tequila is a type of mezcal, basically, that is specifically produced in the state of Jalisco using only blue Weber agave in a process that does not involve smoking the agave hearts like mezcal does. So broadly speaking, I think the term mezcal is similar to the term whiskey, and tequila is similar to the term bourbon. It's like a specific type you know, process. So what is and isn't technically mezcal comes down mainly to federal regulations in Mexico. And there's a lot of weeds to get into there really, I think straight up listing every regulation that governs this stuff is gonna be boring. The main points, tequila can only be made using one type of agave, mezcal can be made using a few dozen varieties, and tequila can only be made in Jalisco, whereas mezcal can be made in Durango, Guerrero, uh, Michoacan, Huaca, Puebla, San Luis Potosi, Potosi, oh, sorry guys, San Luis, oh, San Luis, San Luis, oh boy. San Luis, San Luis Potosi, that's a tough one, man. I'm sorry, that, uh, I'm, it's a long, long way off from high school Spanish class. San Luis Potosi, Tamaulipa, tam, tam, Tamaulipas, Tamaulipas, and uh, Zacatecas. And thank you, I'm so sorry, people of Mexico. I'm genuinely, <laughs> my God. The basic gist of how to produce mezcal is to harvest agave, which if you've never seen one in person or a photo of one with a good size reference in the shot, they are huge plants. They might look like aloe or something, but they're just absolutely massive. And they're also nothing like aloe. They find an agave that's just properly ripe, hack off the leaves or branches or whatever you want to call those things, uh, which leaves a heart of an agave, which is called a piña because it resembles a pineapple, and then you roast the agave piña. Uh, the traditional method is to pit roast them, similar to like a pig roast, actually, where the agave heart is buried in the ground with hot coals for anywhere between um, a few days or a week. You dig out the agave heart and pulverize it, traditionally with a tahona, which is a big stone wheel that's driven around by an ox, which gives me very strong Conan the Bar Barbarian vibes. Uh, then you take the broken, smashed up chunks of roasted agave and ferment it. Um, sometimes they will dry ferment, sometimes they will water ferment, where you add water to it and ferment that soup that you make, and sometimes they will do both of those for different reasons for a various amount of time and then combine them before they distill it. Uh, this fermentation usually happens in an open air fermentation barrel, uh, and the agave wine that they are producing here is called polke. Then you take the polke, you put it into a still. Um, very traditional mezcaleros will still use a clay still, which is a pretty cool piece of ancient technology that is a terracotta clay pot apparatus. I think most of your distillation these days is going to be done on copper pot stills. There's an indicator on a bottle if it's done in a clay still, because you would never go to the trouble of doing this in a clay still and then keeping it a secret. That would be very stupid. It gets uh, typically distilled two or three times to get the concentration up to the final bottling strength, which this is where mezcal is kind of very different from a lot of other spirits. So as far as I know, and I want to stress the point that this is as far as I know, because what I'm about to explain is a huge departure from how I think pretty much every other spirit that I know of is made. So typically, like with a whiskey, for example, you're going to distill the spirit up to a very high proof, 140 proof, 160 proof, and then you will age that spirit in barrels at that rocket fuel proof, also called barrel proof. And then when you bottle it, you deproof it by cutting it with water. With mezcal, they're only distilling it up to bottling proof, though sometimes that bottling proof could be quite high. My understanding here is that traditionally, mezcal is not cut with water. Um, that's not to say that it isn't sometimes, it's just that traditionally it isn't, and probably it, if, if you're talking about high quality mezcals, it would not be. But my thinking here is that this process, where you're not distilling every single drop of non-alcohol out that you have the mash, means that more of those flavors will be preserved and they wind up 
in the bottle. And that does seem to be the case as far as I've read and, and from the limited mezcal tastings I've done. You may be familiar with the term terroir, and if you're not familiar with it, well, you're about to be. It comes mainly from the wine world, but it's the tastes of the earth, that the specific place, that region, that time and place, the rain that we got this year, what fruits were around, if the cicadas were in bloom, whatever, do they bloom? Most spirits don't really have a terroir. The distillation process sort of nukes it. Um, a few are considered to be very terroir though, like a rum agricole uh, and apparently mezcal in particular. They have a terroir. Um, there's a, actually St. George has a gin too that they claim is a terroir gin. Like that's like the St. George terroir gin is like, hey, this is a unique gin. We have preserved the terroir. And for that reason, even though mezcal can be aged and is sold at different age categories, just like tequila, it seems like the joven or unaged mezcal is really the most popular uh, way to have it and the most common. One thing in my mind that I've always had about mezcal is that for me, it's it, I put it in the same category as an Isla Scotch. And that's because mezcal can have that same super duper smoky flavor profile that you would associate with an Isla. In mezcal, that comes from the roasting of the agave and an Isla Scotch, it comes from the process, the barley germination process is halted by smoking it with peat. So it's different smoke sources, different parts of the process. Also, though I haven't tasted a ton of mezcal, my understanding is that not all of the mezcals are gonna be super smoke dominant, particularly some of your wild mezcals are gonna be not super smoke dominant, I think. We're gonna find out in just a minute since I'm gonna taste all these mezcals. Um, oh, and one more thing about agave. So tequila, that's gotta be made with a blue agave um, mezcal. They can use dozens of varieties, but the majority of mezcal is gonna be made from something called an espadin agave, which is sort of the great granddaddy of the blue Weber agave as well. So if you see espadin on a bottle, that's what that means. Uh, a lot of mezcal also uses wild and even foraged agave. When I go through these bottles, I'll be naming, they'll probably tell me what agave they use. It seems to be pretty standard. I'll tell you what it is. But don't expect me to have an example of every single variety of agave here. I actually physically don't think that would be possible. I, I, there's, like I said, dozens. Um, the majority of this will be espadine because as there's limits to my ability, to, even my ability to source spirits, as I know there are yours. I got my uh, spit bucket, which here it is in its first appearance on how to drink. I'll call it the seat belt. This is the seat belt that prevents me from having another tasting accident like we did in the episode that tried to kill me. Uh, which I guess I'll put a link down there below. All of its use will probably be cut from the episode, but a lot of people express concern that I, I drink too much or that this is bad for my health. A lot of you have commented lately that I look tired. I'm exhausted. I have two kids. I'm in the middle of a pandemic and I'm making a show alone. What do you think? Of course I'm tired. I'm also old. If you've been watching an episode that was four years old, like my beard turned gray. I got old. I don't know what to tell you. I need a vacation. Okay. You want me to go on vacation? Don't stop watching the show. So I want you to understand like, this is a lot of mezcal. It would be very stupid for me to just drink all this mezcal that I'm about to taste. So we're gonna use spittoon. You gotta get these, you gotta get oranges. You gotta get these oranges. They're navel oranges, they're oranges from the grocery store. But you gotta get sal de gusano. This is agave worm salt. Yes, this is salt made from agave worms. The agave worm is that worm that you sometimes see at the bottom of a bottle of tequila or mezcal. Um, I don't know how traditional that is. We can. I, I think that that's kind of a touristy thing. And the traditional tasting vessel, as I understand it, is a copita, uh, corpitas, which are these little terracotta guys. They're a little bit glazed on the inside. Um, they're cool. They're just like cool little, they're not shot glasses. They're like little bowls. Um, and that's true. You're not really supposed to like slam mezcal or anything, by the way. If you don't like it and you have to slam it, maybe you should just drink something else. That's fine. You know, I think that's really weird. Like are you sipping your whiskey. Yeah, I like it. Why don't we just start? I have some water. I'm gonna start by putting out my sal de gusano. This stuff, man, I love. It's a little bit smoky. It's a little bit salty. Oh, this smells so good. It smells like barbecue. Uh, so you put your sal de gusano around and then you dip your orange in. Ah, yum, yum, yum. So we're gonna taste. Let's start with Oaxaca. It's over here on the side. Uh, oh, this one's got the worm. Ah, there it is. Shit. Look at that. The first one I've got is a worm. It's disgusting. I hate seeing that little son of a bitch in there because I really hate worms. So I'll tell you what Oaxaca is like. First off, it's spelt very gringo, which is fun. Oaxaca. I guess that's to help you get it right. 100% agave, obviously. It is made in Oaxaca, Mexico. But this is mezcal artisanal. Oh, it's a reposado. Jesus. I went. This is so atypical. Uh, it's an espadine. And I'm going to say avocado con gusano. Uh, I don't know what avocado means, but con gusano means with worms. Um, so. Let's try this warm stuff. This has like a smell like a white wine. A little smoky on it. Ooh, boy. Just absolute random that we start with this one. What is that? It's like, um, well, it smells like tequila. I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, it's not overly smoky. It's pretty mild. And that's probably because it's a reposado. It's a little aged. 
I like that. It does remind me of just like the taste in my mouth of working on the lawnmower and everything that goes with that. That means I'm outside and there's like fresh smells, cut grass, a little bit of oil, motor oil, a little bit of exhaust, but nice. It's a great warming effect. It's not what you would call harsh at all. This is really chill. I think Mezcal is probably gonna fall into the category of acquired taste. So a lot of times people ask me, hey, why do you seem to like everything? Well, I don't necessarily like everything. That's a subjective quality. I just try to give you guys objective qualities of things. Very, very seldom is something objectively bad. I'm trying to help you make informed decisions about what Mezcals you might like. This one reminds me a little, little bit, a little bit of like the sweeter notes of gasoline. If you recall getting your gas pumped when you were a kid and thinking, I like that smell. It's kind of like that. And then sometimes they start to taste like mothballs. I don't know why that is, uh, but that's me. That's my own association. And then, then you know what the fix is? You cleanse your palate. Mm. That's quite a fucking magic combo. This is Del Magüe, San Luis del Rio, uh, 47%, single, val single village mezcal. You'll see that sometimes, single village, like that is the, the, the larger company has come, they acquire and bottle some really local traditional variety. Uh, brings you a collection of artisanal and ancestral mezcals made in the lush remote mountain plains and valleys of Oaxaca. Each expression is named to a village, etc., etc., etc. So this is San Luis del Rio. Or it's an Espadín. Okay. Pour a little tiny taste. Tiniest. I mean, a tiny little nip here. Honestly, the amount that I'm tasting is so small. I don't know that I can spit it back out. It's just enough to like coat my teeth. That's a little more aggressive. That has some very strong. Boy, I wish I knew the chemical name for that stuff. I don't. It just reminds me of like, I'm going to say mothballs. I don't know if mothballs is right. It reminds me of this household cleanser that was always around my grandmother's house. I personally don't have the palate to pull apart all of the subtleties of that one. That one is, but it's not, I'll say this. I've had a lot smokier mezcals. This is not supremely smoky. It has some iodine notes, maybe. I don't know if that's literally iodine, but it kind of is like that kind of um, acridy iodine parts. Is it salty? Yeah, you might call that salty. It's not salty in the way that eating some salt is, but like, yeah, I, if I was drinking this as a whiskey, I'm trying to think about that now, and I don't have salted oranges to compare it against. Yeah, I might say that's a little salty. And it has this kind of chemical taste. But it's not a kind of chemical taste that I know you're going to, you have to hate. It's one that could be an acquired taste. So if you're a mezcal drinker and you know what I'm talking about, you may find that appreciative. Um, this is Herodes, which is a mezcal artisanal from De Oregon. No, uh, it's from Oaxaca. It is a coupage de espadines. So it's 100% maguey espadin. Oh, wow. This is a completely different nose on it. I mean, that smells like fresh fruit, like apples almost. Whoa, that's, whoa, that's so different. That reminds me of like Applejack. That, that's crazy how different that is. That tastes like a Calvados. That tastes nothing like the other two that we've had so far, which is really fun. I think that's super exciting to find like all three of these are Espadine, right? Yeah, they all are. Um, what a difference that is, man. That's huge departure. It's like bright and fresh and um, airy. There's a, a note in there that tastes a little, no one's gonna like to hear this, but this is honestly where my brain goes. Tastes a little, like just a just a touch, just a hint. There's a reminiscence about something I took. I think it was K.O. Pectate for an update stomach, stomach, the white chalky one. But I mean, it's it's here and gone. It's here and gone. It's not the main flavor, and it's just a personal association that I have with it. Boy, that just really reminds me of a Calvados or some kind of an apple-based spirit, which is fascinating how a smoked agave can taste like that. That's crazy. And Play-Doh. A little bit of like, that's what it was. It wasn't milk and magnesia. It was like Play-Doh for a touch, just for a touch. This one is a very exciting one because look at the bottle. That is some cool ass looking presentation. And I am a sucker for cool presentation. Uh, Oaxaca, Oven, Espadín, unless Baril y Mexicano. Yeah, actually, I think that's the agave. It's Magua, Espadín, Baril y Mexicano. So, and it's made in the town of San... Dionisio y Rio de Utla. Dionisio. <laughs> Saint Dionysus. All right. This might be good stuff. Oh, that was a big pour. That's going to be one that's going to wind up in there a little bit. This bottle does not permit me to do a very gentle pour. So I've got more in my little copita than I would like. But buttery. 
Oh my god, the nose smells like melting butter. Holy shit, that's so cool. Peppery. It's so peppery. It tastes like chopped up bell peppers. Like a little bit spicier than chopped up bell peppers. Just like that kind of slightly astringent fresh vegetable vibe. Man, that's some cool stuff. And not really very smoky at all. A little bit, not bitter, but a little bit astringent and buttery. Wow, that's cool. I like that one a lot. Bozal. Mm, I like that one. It's a shame, but you know, that's what that's, that's what that's there for. Back to another Del Maguey offering. Single Village, this is Las Milpas. Mm, Esparin. There's still one copper pot stills. Del Maguey. Las Milpas. Las Milpas. Whoa. What is that smell? It has a... Oh man, what is that smell? That has a really... So stupid. High pitch, high tenor kind of chemical smell. Um, I don't know, you know, pitch sounds weird, but like it has that bright smell way up here, but I can't place it. It smells a little bit like disinfectant, but not like bleach. It smells a little bit like, a little bit, a little bit like, you know, like Barbasol or something that your doctor's office would use, but like not in a way that's overpowering. Like I hate that smell of a doctor's office. I like it here. It's really muted. It's a relation to that, whatever that smell is there. This is a relation to that thinned way out, not nasty. Okay, I don't like that one. Oh man, I dislike that one a lot. That one has a flavor I just hate. Uh, it's it's a obviously personal taste issue. Somebody likes this. I'm not that guy. Fuck, I'm sorry to hate to say that. Um, it's a very aggressively chemical flavor. Um, kind of. I, that's a strong mezcal. That one is very uh, kind of knocks the wind out of you. I'm not. That's not for me. Um, personal taste, personal thing. Yeah. I'm really sorry, last milk bus. That one, I mean, I hate to say, this is the nastiest thing to say. That one kind of reminds me of like siphoning gas and actually getting a mouthful of gasoline. Like that is not my jam. I'm sorry. Miss Calvago um, by Aquilino Garcia. It is, this is an A. Karwinski um, agave plant from Candelaria Yegole, stone grind, copper still, March 2020. Batch, the batch of that, that batch was 287 liters. That is, like, that is small batch. That is crazy small. <laughs> fresh cut grass. Super strong fresh cut grass smell. Oh yeah. That just smells. I'm playing in the backyard when you were a kid. Very apple -y. Very fresh grass. Wild onions. I mean, that is... A dimension apart from the rest of these guys is wildly different. That's cool. Um, I would have to be in the mood for that, but I don't hate that at all. It does have a, uh, there's a late arriving kind of chemical astringency. Um, that's kind of the taste of cactus, I think, is what that is. And it's something you either like or you don't like. It has that monopale taste. This one is called Dos Ambres. You'll never guess who the Dos Ambres are. It's Aaron Paul and Brian Cranston. I guess they saw how much money uh, uh, George Clooney made on tequila and they said, we better get in on something here. Apples again. So, Joven Agave. I think it's actually, it's a sub thing of Espadine. It's A. Angustifolia. Angustifolia. Uh, so, but it's a type of Espadine. Is that watermelon? Kind of like copper and watermelon and apples. Definitely the coppery. Oh, that's got a strong, um, like mothball taste. That's main flavor I get on that. It's not bad. I mean, I think that the, you see that enough in this. That a lot of people must like that or seek that out. So it is the primary flavor here is that kind of mothball-y taste. Um, I'm not catching a lot of elder stuff on here. It's not particularly smoky. Although, for all I know, my smoke receptors are kind of burned out at this point. It is kind of that one note. But light, it's kind of, it's cool to the mouth, honestly. Cooler than a lot of the other ones. This one almost, I mean, they're not, they're all at the same temperature. This one has a kind of, almost like it was refrigerated vibe to it. Um, how that happens, I don't know. No, not as many twists and turns as like the Bozal or the Mexical Vago, which are both really interesting. And I really like the Oaxaca, which it makes sense because I don't really have, I mean, it's the one that was apparently a um, little bit older. So it's kind of muted some of its flavors, which for a guy like me makes a lot of sense because I don't really, I'm not a huge mezcal lover. I like it though. I mean, I do like what I've had. I find this very enjoyable, but I'm not like a 
You know, I'm not looking for the most aggressive mezcals. I'm looking for stuff that's pretty easy sipping. This is Mezcal de Rumbes, San Luis Potiso, Potosi. A lot of these were from Oaxaca, so this one is definitely not Oaxaca. Salmiana, that's the agave. Above ground stone with Quixote. Uh, Tahona, wild yeast in rock and copper pot still. So this one should be fairly unique based on that layout of things. I mean, it's a different place, it's different everything. This has a very similar coppery smell. I think it was the, was it the Dos Ombres that had the, comp the coppery smell? Very similar. Yeah, like a metallic smell. Wow! Dude, I love that. That is cool. That is like, um, it's like sweet, actually. I mean, I don't think it's sweetened, but it has a very vegetal, sweet taste. What a surprise. That is nothing like these other ones. It must be the agave, the salmiana. It tastes like what you would imagine just like slicing into a big fresh aloe or agave would taste like. Would you imagine it would taste like? <laughs> Not even like what it would actually taste like. Ooh. Oh, man, that's cool. It's a little bit fruity in a weird sideways kind of way. Like... Almost like it's an imagined fruit that you've never had before. That one's really cool. Which is funny because I am a sucker for packaging like so many humans. And I look at that and I would think, eh, what is this like, I don't know, a discotheque bottle. I don't, I'm not in love, you know, it would be one that I would think I'm not a fan, but just based on that, you know. But it's good. That's good stuff. I like that. I like that a lot. That's really interesting. Um, if you like a really harsh mezcal, this one may not be for you. I find that to be a really cool mezcal because it's, honestly, it's just not anything. It's really unique. I mean, it's like the Bozal and the Vago both had really kind of their own thing going on. So does this. This is very not like the others, um, which is fine. It's just nothing wrong with any of these, honestly. Um, it's just interesting when one is really breaking the mold. And I wonder if, if that is a whole style that is more like that or if this is really kind of just a unique you know, Derumbes uh, tastes like none, none of the other ones at all. Maybe all mezcal from San Luis Potosi tastes a little bit that way. This is a Megue. Um, Madre Cushi, made by a single palenco. This is Hoven, 100% Megue. I mean, it's agave. It's Oaxaca, cultivated Madre Cushi. I don't know how to pronounce that. Cooked in an oven pit, smashed by hand with wooden Mezquite mallets into a stone canoe. Holy shit. That sounds exhausting. Fermented in wooden pine vats. Oh, pine. Natural yeast, five days. Distilled in, a, double distilled in copper with a 350 liter capacity by wood fire. 53% alcohol from the still, it says right there, still proof. So, I mean, that's it. They only went to 53%. Fresh cut grass again. I think that that's gonna be a common theme with, I mean, gonna be, we're almost done. That has been a common theme, the fresh cut grass. It kind of smells like a cut succulent, like you've cut into a succulent. Now it's picking up like hay. Now it smells like hay. I, I was gonna say it smells like a horse farm, but I'm gonna be a little bit more, um, cause I spent a lot of time on horse farms growing up. I'm gonna be a little bit more political. Uh, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. It doesn't smell like manure. It smells like straw, hay. Definitely. Yes, very much so. It's like it's more specific than spe fresh cut grass. Cool to your lips. What the shit? Damn! That's got some kind of smoke, like, backdraft that comes up out of your lungs. Um, it starts out cool to your lips. Oh, this is some nice uh, vegetal fruit forward. And then, like, <laughs> the dragon shows up, man. It just got some serious um, smoke in there, but not smoke like um a peat or a scotch smoky at all like that that's got some like uh like a mesquite or something i don't know like like a, a dry bitter kind of smoke acrid smoke Woo! yowza damn oh my god holy shit tiny amounts go a long way with that one man that's that is some serious shit it's good but definitely uh that's that that Put some hair on your chest. That ain't no joke. 100%, you're like, oh, I'm here for this. I'm along for the ride. It never overtook me. It never was like, ah, stop. I don't want it. Which is maybe what's so surprising about it because it is, that's a lot of flavor, a lot of smoke, a lot of acrid notes without ever being like, this is too much. Um, there's still nuance to it, which is pretty cool. That's cool shit. So these three, um, I mentioned to Curiata, and by the way, I should tell you guys, Curiata, um, I don't, they won't have all of these, but Curiata should have a number of these mezcals if you want to try any of these for yourself. I'm pretty sure that they have Wa. I think that's why they sent them. And I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it wrong. 
I assume that's pronounced Wa, like Oaxaca. I don't, I don't know. Um, for, of course, I looked at it and I said, Oaks, interesting. I'm pretty sure that's Wa. I told them I was doing a thing on tasting mezcal. They said, oh, we got to send you these. They're awesome. Um, they do come in really cool bottles. These are like porcelain bottles. They kind of evoke a retro future Mayan revival slash um, Memphis style like 80s thing. I fucking love these bottles. And this one, we'll just do all three. They're all artisanal, hoven. Uh, this one is Aroqueño. This is Aroqueño is what the agave variety is here. The one thing I will say about these, bring, I made this mistake recently, bring the glass to them. Don't think you're going to like, man, it'll mess you up trying to, they, they pour like crazy. Um, so this is the black bottle, which is Aroqueño. What does that smell? It smells a little bit vegetal, but it's a little bit, um, a little earthy. A little dirt, a little bit of metal, a little bit of copper, a little bit of like, is that latex? Maybe? Could be a little bit of latex smell. Not really, because latex tends to smell more bleachy. Uh, just, you know what it is? I think it smells a little doctor's office. This one has that strong um, mothball taste for me. Uh, kind of right away, and it lingers. You get it, it goes away, and then it comes back on your breath. Not as loud as some of the other ones. So if you're looking for that flavor in a mezcal, maybe. The Wa Aroqueño is uh, the one to go with. There's some like buttery notes in there too. It's pretty cool. I like that actually. I like that one because I found that the bigger sip, I actually got a little less of the mothball taste, which is not my favorite thing. Moderated it a bit. Um, more buttery, more vegetal, more fresh cut grass, which again, a common theme with these. Um, and that might just be the limits of my palate. Maybe that's just the parts I can really detect. This is Tobala, another Hoven. Cool, let's try it. Ooh, wait a second. I think I'm gonna like this one. We gotta clean. We gotta give this one its fair due and uh, do a little palate cleansing first. So this is Tobala. Oh man, a little Bactine smell there. A lot of that mothball taste. And then something else, like sweetened, like sweeter mothball-y tastes. I'm not, I'm not as quite in love with that as I thought I was going to be based on the, uh, the nose. It's like a salty smoke acrid vibe there. Um, and maybe a bit of the mothball taste, but that's a smokier one. Not all of these have been real smoky. That one I was reading is pretty smoky to me. Um, okay, let's move on to the last one. This is the Tepezate. Tepezate. A ZT is a tough one for me. Hay, straw, strong hay smell. Like sea, like being by the sea. Like, like sitting on the beach and smelling the ocean and a fire. Sitting on the beach um, and smelling the ocean over a really smoky, acrid campfire. Cool. All of these are best enjoyed in small tastes because they're very potent flavors that are easy to overpower your palate. And they're meant to be sipped, okay? That's why the copitas are very, very small bowls. My personal favorites, I was really impressed by the Bazal, if I recall. I really like this Oaxaca. And I liked the Vago a lot. Those were my three favorites. And over on this side, oh, and I love this. This was really neat. The San Luis Potosi. Hopefully this is gonna give you some information about mezcal that you didn't have before. It did for me, um, and it will help you make a decision when you buy some mezcal. Why not do so from Curiata? Using the link in the pinned comment right beneath you. Until next time, this has been HTD. Today we were just tasting a bunch of mezcal. Really basics kind of explainer episode and maybe they're gonna be upset about some of my tasting notes because I don't think I really have a very refined palate for mezcal. I, honestly, I'm glad you watched, but you should probably take my mezcal tasting with a grain of salt because I'm not a mezcal pro. Um, but maybe that's more useful. Maybe your palate is, your, I mean, in all honesty, your palate's probably closer to mine than some mezcal aficionado because you're probably not that guy. Um, so I'm coming at this as kind of a mezcal beginner. Anyway, um, I will see you guys in just a few days with another episode of HTD. Until then, check out my socials, which you are aware of, and here they are on screen. If you're watching this episode, thank you. You're one of the very rare few who make it to the end. We are approaching the end. Uh, check out Curiata, uh, drink.curiata.com, or use the pinned comment in the link below. And uh, hey, check out these other episodes of How to Drink, since I've been making this show for a long time. Time. And there's a big back catalog of episodes 
that exist and they are thirsty for your eyeballs. They're eye thirsty. They have the eye thirst. That is the grossest expression I could have possibly come up with there. We should stop now while I'm ahead.